Okay, so we're talking about more types of waves here. We're looking at light waves and sound waves. First, we're going to start talking about light waves in terms of what we experience. We're starting with what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, whenever we're talking about waves, um, there's lots of different waves in the world. These waves, like in the ocean, these are what's called mechanical waves, mechanical waves. That means they go through stuff. In this case, in the ocean, it goes through water. Without the water, there would be no wave. Or like a wave you'd see in the flag. These are still mechanical waves. They require what's called a medium. Medium means the material that the wave is moving through, because we know that waves are just energy. But mechanical waves are a type of wave where the energy still needs a medium to travel through. Sound, we're going to talk about more towards the end. Sound is another kind of mechanical wave. Sometimes we'll call it a pressure wave. Sound that you and I typically think of typically travels through the air, but it can travel through any substance. Um, you might have heard it, tried to hear sounds underwater. Our brain doesn't process them the same because the sound waves don't travel the same because of the different medium. In this case, the medium would be the water the reason why there's no sound in space because there's no particles in space there's no material to transmit a mechanical wave mechanical waves need a medium in the space there's not one okay so our electromagnetic waves these are special they're electric fields and magnetic fields they do not need a medium they exist in empty space and they can move through things that are opaque like air but they're not actually require a medium. They come up all over the place. Um, visible light is the one that we are most familiar with. Visible light is, um, I say visible because there are other types of light that we can't see. So light becomes a little bit of a difficult word because I say light, do I mean just the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, what you and I see, everything between red and blue? Or am I talking about the entire electromagnetic spectrum? So light's not that specific. So this, um, the different types of light in the electromagnetic spectrum can be classified by wavelength or frequency. They all have the same velocity. They all go the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. Because if you have a very, very long wavelength, you're not going to fit as many waves in there. They won't occur as frequently. So the longer your wavelength, the lower your frequency, the lower your energy. So radio waves are at the bottom, to microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma. We'll look at them all briefly. Okay. So we already know about our crests and troughs. Wavelength measures one complete cycle. So the visible section is actually a very narrow section there right in the middle. Radio waves. Radio waves are the longest wavelength. Now, whenever you have a very long wavelength, a very low energy, it's very useful because they travel very far. And the longer the wavelength, the better it is at moving through things. So radio waves do a really good job moving through walls, for example. The, um, the reason we use radio waves is so that we can receive them in all kinds of locations. They can also be broadcast over great distances. The cell phones, like the very modern phone you use here, are, um, are types of radio waves as well. The, um, just like listen to FM radio and AM radio, the difference is which specific wavelength and what frequency is it. We can use um, radio waves to get pictures. Now, our eyes can absorb it, but just like a digital camera can absorb visible light, we can have other digital cameras that absorb light of different wavelengths that we can't see. Now we'll have to use computer software to adjust the picture to show us where there was radio and where there wasn't radio. The, now this is taken from up in the air, 
since radio waves are so big, we have to use a very large imaging apparatus. This is a series of giant um, uh, receivers, uh, telescopes, receiving dishes that we put all together and then they all absorb the radios and we can take pictures from very far. The, uh, we use this in astronomy. That's what it's used for. Okay, microwaves. Microwaves are next. Microwaves are shorter than radio waves. Um, we're talking in the period of centimeters here. The useful thing about microwaves is that they are the same wavelength that water likes to absorb. And so water absorbs the microwaves very easily, which means that they absorb that energy, which allows it to cook with them very nicely. The um, microwaves are what we use in radar. The, so one of the things we have to realize is that whenever we're using an electromagnetic radiation uh, to see something, we can't see anything that's shorter than one wavelength. So um, microwaves are good for radar because whenever we're looking for things like planes, if we can get down to a centimeter or so, that's fine. That's going to tell us plenty of information about the plane, but it's still a long enough wavelength that it's not going to get blocked by things like clouds. Because droplets of water are much smaller than the wavelength, so we'll see right through them. Or the microwaves move right through them. The, um, which gives us much better visibility. So the microwaves can penetrate haze, light rain, snow, cloud smoke, um, and even things like leaves. It allows us to get pictures of things we normally can't see. Uh, like this is a picture of the Amazon River. Infrared, we're getting really close to what we can see. The, we're talking about micrometers at this point. So. Um, an infrared wave is about the size of a pinhead. The, we talked about radiation in terms of thermal transfer. The wavelength that's infrared is very easily absorbed by our skin. Uh, we absorb that energy and we feel that energy. We absorb it as kinetic energy, so we feel it as heat, as temperature. The... Um, Things like a TV remote control, that's using infrared light. The We can't see it because it's infrared. Infra means below. But it still is actually light. And there is a very small camera on your TV. And the only thing that camera does, it's not so much a camera, it's more of a sensor. It just sees if there is infrared or there isn't. And the different pattern that it gets from the remote is how it gets the information. Um... So whenever things are warm, they tend to give off light. This is most obvious when we deal with things that are very hot. We see with our eyes, we say they glow red hot. Because red is the lowest energy. That once they get hot enough that they're emitting light that you and I can see, they start to hit red. If they get hotter and hotter, they'll get into other colors. They'll get to orange, to yellow. The... But even when they're below the temperature, and when we say they're red hot, like our stove glowing, they still, they still put off light. It's just light below the colors we can see, infrared. So we can make a camera, a digital camera, that can absorb this light, and we can see what kind of wavelengths they're putting off. And depending what kind of wavelengths are coming off of an object will tell us about their temperature. Um, now remember, we're not really seeing these colors. The camera absorbs all the different wavelengths, records what wavelengths it's getting where, and then the computer software translates it to another image, and it assigns a color we can see for each one of those wavelengths. It lets us get the differences. Some, some creatures have different eyes than you and I have, um, different different senses. Um, so for example, rattlesnakes can see 
below red. They can see into the infrared, things that we don't pick up at all. Visible light we're most familiar with is visible. These are all the colors we see from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. It's actually a relatively small area. Um, ultraviolet, ultra would be above. Ultraviolet is just above what we can see. The um, Actually, bees can see in the ultraviolet. Their eyes are adapted so they can see those long, those uh, higher energy. Um, our sun gives off a lot of ultraviolet radiation. That's what causes sunburns. The, um, even sometimes on cloudy days, if the clouds are just right so that light can light the visible light doesn't get through so it looks like it's not that bright to us but the ultraviolet still gets through then um, depending on you know what particles happen to be in the air sometimes you can get sunburned on a cloudy day and because it's the ultraviolet light that's causing that and that's why sunscreens have a UV index the UV stands for ultraviolet x-rays x-rays are higher energy still now remember I told you that we can't see anything that's smaller than the wavelengths. So x-rays are useful because they're very small wavelengths. We can see small things with them. Um, they're very high energy because of their low frequency. I'm sorry, because of the high frequency. They have a low wavelength. Low wavelength, high frequency. That means high energy. The, um, we started using x-rays you know, not that long ago, just over 100 years. This right here is our first x-ray picture. Now, whenever you think about this, this x-ray picture is really um, a shadow because we're using a film that can absorb the x-rays and we're putting something in between it that the x-rays can't go through, like bone. The x-rays go through our skin just like visible light goes through glass. And so, really what the x-ray image is, is a shadow. It's the light that's not getting through. What's white in the image is where the x-rays were hitting. And that's why they're always dark, because they're blocking the x-ray light from getting through. The, so we, we can get pictures with x-rays all over the place in the same way that we get pictures of anything else. But we're using digital camera or some kind of film that absorbs it. But they're always monochromatic, meaning that this tells us where the light is and isn't. So this would be an image of the sun, uh, only absorbing the, only emitting the X-rays. Now remember, it doesn't really look red because we can't see X-rays with our eyes. The software on the computer has translated it over to a color we can see. Gamma rays are what our highest energy rays are. They're pretty rare because they're so energetic. Um, they have a very small wavelength. They only happen in you know, like the destruction of stars and atoms um, and things like that. So they they happen in very high energy situations, um, nuclear events, destruction of atoms, um, that kind of thing. Now, we've already talked about reflection. We talk about absorption. So, in terms of light, right now my shirt appears green. It appears green because it's absorbing all the colors that aren't green. Because white light is hitting me, but the blue and the red, that's being absorbed by my shirt. It's absorbing that energy. The green is being reflected. So the green light hits and bounces off, and it's the green light coming to your eyes. And that's why you're seeing the green. Because the materials, the pigments, the different chemical can absorb different wavelengths and reflect others. So absorption is just when the wave is soaked up. Now typically we always get a little bit of absorption and a little bit of reflection. It's usually not perfect. Even a mirror, a mirror is really really good at reflecting things but not perfect. A little bit gets absorbed and things like um, even the 
the darkest black absorbs almost all the light still a little bit i mean you can still see it there so it's always somewhere in between you don't get 100 percent absorption 100 percent reflection whenever you look in the auditorium there's a reason that you have um all the padding everywhere and curtains it's not always for decoration they're soft they're textured they're squishy those things tend to be really good absorbers they absorb uh, the sound waves in this case when we're talking about a theater um, and that allows they're not so it doesn't reflect you'll get a lot of echoes and improves the sound quality whenever in that area because if they were hard surfaces, hard flat surfaces tend to give us more reflection. And we'll get things like echoes going on. Now, sometimes that's useful for doing something like sonar. Sonar will send out some sound waves, we'll let them bounce off of something, and we'll record them coming back. The sound waves that come back, depending on how long it takes, and depending what direction they're coming from, and any of the properties have been changed, we can find out what they bounced off of, gives us some information. The, um, and we can figure out the distance, because if we know the velocity of sound in that material, and we know how much time it took, well, velocity is distance over time, all we have to do is figure out how much distance it's traveled, but it traveled down and back up, so we divide the distance by two, and we have it. Whenever we're listening to sound, um, we get interference sometimes, constructive and destructive. So we have two waves here, the red wave and the blue wave. So these are the two waves that are playing simultaneously. Now they're slightly out of phase. That means they don't have the exact same wavelength and frequency. Um, so where they tend to line up, if you see where it says CI, that's our constructive interference. When they tend to line up, we get this nice big constructive interference wave. So whenever two waves are in the same place, you don't see them both individually. All you see is the interference pattern, or here in this case. All we would hear is the interference pattern. So the only thing we detect is the green one. It's as if there's only one wave. There's two, still two separate waves interacting, but the only thing we detect is the one green wave. So you look in green, whenever they get nice and big constructive, we get that big constructive interference with high amplitude. And then where you see the DI, the destructive, that's where crest lines up with trough, and now the green wave is almost gone. It's quiet. So if you imagine listening to the green wave, it gets loud and soft. Loud and soft. Those are beats. The Doppler effect is another uh, very interesting interaction we get with sound and light. It happens because it's an apparent change in frequency. Apparent means how it appears. It only seems to be different. The true source of it is really not any different. It's only because of motion. Either what's emitting the wave is moving, or whoever's detecting the wave, it, in this case probably us, is moving. So whenever like an ambulance is coming towards you, or a vehicle is coming towards you, it changes the pitch. Whenever we're talking about sound, frequency determines pitch. Amplitude determines loudness. It's very important. So pitch comes from the frequency. The loudness comes from the amplitude. The, so whenever it's coming towards us, the pitch seems different than when it's going away from us. Okay, here we're looking at an example of the Doppler effect. So I have this plane moving. I have it paused right now. You can see in front of the plane the waves are closer together, a higher frequency. Then behind the plane, the waves are spread out, a lower frequency. Now, I'm going to go ahead and park my plane right there. Um, whenever I make it really slow, it's going to call it car. So if my car is sitting there, you can see that it sends out the sound waves in all directions, exactly the same. If I pause it, you can see that there's the same amount of distance here as there, the same frequency. I have it at 1,000 hertz. But once I get my plane moving, it's like the plane is catching up with the sound waves in front. Whenever it catches up with them, it, uh, it puts out more sound waves, it's kind of getting all squished up. And it's like the sound waves behind are being left behind almost, as they're getting spread out a lower frequency. This is the Doppler effect. 
the same thing would happen if I parked my car and I made the guy run away. He would hear that different sound too. So when he's right here, he's hearing 1,500 hertz. Over here, he's only hearing 450. Since if he's going into them and crashing against him or going away. Though this tends to be a lot easier to see whenever the source is moving, even though it's the exact same effect. Now, if my plane gets going so fast, right now I have the velocity of sound set at 340. That's in dry air at one atmosphere at standard, standard temperature. If I get him going fast enough, see he's going very close to the speed of sound. The sound is only barely moving faster than. I'm only getting fa moving faster than sound. When they're moving faster than sound, notice a couple things happen. First of all, the sound never gets in front of them. It's moving faster than it. And all the waves all start off the front, so they'll get bunched up there. You also get this straight line right here. This straight line is made out of all of these circles. So that circle there, that circle there, that circle there, that circle there. This is what's called the wave front. We would call this a bow wave or a shock wave even. The... Um, that's that sonic boom you hear. I'm going to go and put a bunch of waves in between so you can see all of them really nicely. You see whenever I sped it up there how the cone shape changes? You speed them back down lower than the speed of uh, sound and you can see the difference again. Now what's interesting about this, this happens for light too. Light will go with the Doppler effect. We get a change in frequency. The difference is in light. In light, we get a change in color. Let me... So, for example, a star is moving around a distant galaxy. Say it's going in a circle here. The Whenever the star is coming closer to us, the frequency seems greater, and we get blue. Whenever it's going away from us, the frequency seems lower, and it gets more red. We call that red shift and blue shift. Just like we get the different pitches and sound. So bats use um, sonar to locate food and navigate. A lot of creatures do. Uh, dolphins do. Whales do. They use those reflection properties as well as the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect means that as they're flying and if there's a bug moving, the sound, the little chirping sound they make bounces off them and their ears hear it back. And when they hear it come back, they not only know what direction it's in because something's bounced back in that direction, they know how fast it's moving because of the, the apparent change in the frequency. So one of the differences between our sound waves and our electromagnetic waves is what kind of waves they are. So we have two different kinds. You can see on the bottom left, spelled out longitudinal waves and transverse waves. So our sound waves are longitudinal. They're compression. The sound the air gets squished together in a compression, it spreads out in a rarefaction. Squished together in a compression, spreads out in a rarefaction. We commonly use springs to represent this, as you can see on the top. Um, a on the top is a longitudinal wave. You can see there's compressions and rarefaction where it squeezes together and spreads apart. You can still see that the same wavelength idea is still there, just like in the transverse wave that's below. So our transverse waves have crests and troughs. Our longitudinal waves have compressions and rarefactions. The rarefaction words be easy to remember because rare means not very much. Um, they're hard to find. So in a rarefaction, it's harder to find the particles in that area. It's harder to find the coils. 
Now, the one thing you really want to take away from this picture is those arrows up there by the hands. So in A, the longitudinal wave, the arrow is going left and right, left and right. Now, the wave is traveling to the right, and the vibration is going left and right. So if the vibration, the oscillation, is in the same direction as where our wave moves, that's longitudinal. In B, my wave is still going to the right. The velocity is still the same direction, but now the oscillation vibration is up and down. So the two directions are different in a transverse wave. That is extremely important. It's direction of the vibration of the particle. So all the sound we hear, um, they're calling it a pressure wave here. That's a longitudinal wave. It's an energy that's moving through air that's compressing the air and the air spreads out. The we have pretty good hearing as compared to a lot of things, actually. Um, we can hear all the way down to 20 hertz. That means 20 wavelengths over one second, all the way almost up to 20,000 wavelengths in one second, 20 hertz. Any waves below 20 hertz are called infrasonic. Infra meaning below, just like infrared, infrasonic. And 20,000 hertz above that, we call it ultrasonic. So ultra means above, just like ultraviolet was above violet. Um, now, this 20 hertz and this 20,000 hertz, frequently you'll see the 20,000 hertz is 20 kilohertz. Um, that's when our hearing's at its best, whenever we're young. As we get old, we can't hear all the way down to 20, and we can't hear all the way up to 20,000. The range that we can hear tends to narrow so we can hear things in the middle better. All right, let's do a quick review here. So waves. Waves transfer or carry energy. They do not carry matter. Waves are not made out of stuff. There's two different groups, mechanical waves and electromagnetic waves. Mechanical waves transfer energy through matter called a medium. That's the stuff that they're going through like solids, liquids, and gases. They have to have stuff. Without any stuff, there can be no mechanical wave. We have two kinds of mechanical waves. Longitudinal waves, compression waves, where the matter is forward and back in the same direction of the wave movement. Um, sound is a good example of that, or the spring. We can also have transverse waves. The matter is up and down, or back and forth but it's at rat angles compared to the direction of the wave movement. Whatever direction the wave is moving in, they're vibrating in another one, like the waves we see on top of the ocean, or um, like, uh, like doing a pulse down a rope, whipping it real quick. Now, our electromagnetic waves do not require matter. They can move through empty space to transfer energy. They, they include examples such as um, light, Light is our special case of electromagnetic waves, and they are transverse, the electric field and the magnetic field. Okay, here we have some Doppler effect happening. The person here is standing, and they're the one listening to the wave. So if See, I'm going to take the velocity of my source, I'm going to stop it there. If it's sitting still, we can see that the distance between the waves is the same. The frequency we're hearing it at 1000 hertz. And so here we're hearing this very clear sign, sound. But if I get it moving, I'll move it quite fast so that we can get a real clear difference. The waves in front of it, these waves in front, are getting kind of squished together because the first one that's that's put out this in this case I have a plane the plane moves forward and emits the next one so but it went forward to do it 